Welcome everybody. And we are live. Good morning and welcome to the USDA grant programs webinar and farmer Q&A. My name is Kelly Henwood and I am the Regional Small Farms Program Coordinator for WSU Extension in Clallam, Jefferson and Kitsap counties. This webinar was organized by WSU Extension and the North Olympic Development Council and was made possible by funding from the USDA Rural Business Development Program. Guest speakers today include Carlotta Denisi with USDA Rural Development and Ryan McCarthy from Dungeness Valley Creamery. Our moderator today is Mark Bowman, Sustainable Ag Agriculture Program Coordinator with the North Olympic Development Council and goat farmer extraordinaire, owner of Bowman Farms LLC out of Port Angeles. If you have questions for the guest speakers throughout our webinar, please utilize the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Two more things. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing afterwards. The recording will be sent to you all after the webinar, as well as uploaded on our Small Farms YouTube channel and placed onto our website. After the webinar is over, you will all be sent a very brief webinar evaluation. Since this webinar is grant funded, we greatly appreciate your feedback. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator, Mark Bowman. Mark? Great, thank you, Kelly. Welcome everyone. Uh, so we're going to start with Carlotta is gonna spend uh, about 20, 25 minutes uh, going through two of the grant programs that are upcoming uh, this spring, and she'll give more of the details of those. And um, at the end of the her presentation, uh, we'll spend just a few minutes answering some questions in the Q&A uh, box that, uh, that you may post for her. Right after that, then we'll spend some time um, asking questions ourselves of both Ryan McCarthy of Dungeness Valley Creamery and Carlotta. And uh, we'll spend the rest of the time through the end of the hour uh, going through uh, some questions that will hopefully uh, make your uh, application process easier. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carlotta to get started with, uh, she's going to begin with the Rural Energy for America program, the REAP grant. Carlotta. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I am Carlotta Denisi, Business Program Specialist. I'm located in Olympia, and the peninsula is part of the area that I service, so I'd be happy to share um, the REAP, Rural Energy for America program, and then following that, the Value Added Producer Grant program. Um, I will have to move along pretty quickly through it, and even though we have questions and answers, I would expect that you would, uh, if you are uh, really interested, you will be free to contact me and my phone number and email will be, is made available on, on both of the uh, presentations that are being done today. And, and I would welcome any contact from anybody that wants to pursue either program. So let's start with what I would call the easier of the two programs, the REAP. And this program is uh, designed for ag producers, ranchers, and rural small businesses. Um, of course, all of um, Clallam and Jefferson County are rural anyway, so all of our programs are eligible under business. Um, this program is meant to assist um, uh, farms, branches, and small businesses to either um, put up a renewable energy project project like um, solar, done a lot of solar projects, and it also can be used for energy uh, efficiency improvements. Um, so if, you know, uh, renewable energy can be more than just solar, but that's uh, one that we have typically seen in that energy efficiency would be anything that an energy audit would show that would save energy. So it could be um, equipment, could be lighting, HVAC, um, irrigation pumps, any of those kind of things that would show up in an energy audit. Um, so to qualify as an ag producer, over 50% of your income would have to be derived from um, ag production. 
um, but you can also qualify, even if you have a farm, you can qualify as a rural small business, whether you have an LLC or you're a company or even a um, sole proprietorship can be eligible. Uh, so those would be the eligible uh, applicants. Um, the eligible, um, the matching funds for the REAP program is 75%. So our grant would cover 25% of your project costs. And it is a reimbursable grant. So that means that your project needs to be completed, you know, after uh, the approval process and all that goes through and awards. And then um, reimbursement for those funds can be made if you have been funded. Um, so it's a, uh, there is, you know, paperwork. It's not uh, too difficult. We have assistance from a partner agency that can also assist and I can provide you with contact information um, for that program. Um, the deadline that has been set up for applications to be received um, in Olympia, and it can be electronic also as long as they're signed, is March 31st of 2021. So that deadline is coming up, but that is still enough time to apply for that program. And I would encourage anybody who's interested to contact me um, and we can uh, move forward with helping you with an application. Uh, I think that's all I was going to say on the REAP program. Um, oh, I did want to add to the REAP, I'm sorry, is that it is only for business or farm use. So if it's for residential, our grant funds cannot cover a project that would assist a residential property. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, there may be a, a, let's say a farm and a home or a business and a home sharing um, the uh, meter, the electric meter. Uh, that's fine. Uh, there is a process that can uh, uh, be in place to separate the energy use of the residential from the farm or business. So that may um, also uh, come into play. It's just that we would have to not count the energy usage of the residential. Um, and then for the smaller um, grants up to 20,000, um, typically people are not looking for loans, but um, there are a lot of uh, um, credit unions that will do those energy loans up to 50,000. If you're looking at lar a much larger project, there is a guaranteed loan in process, but we haven't utilized that uh, too much uh, except for some of these very large um, applications. Again, um, you're welcome to contact me directly, telephone or email. And I think I can move on to the value added deck. And we were going to wait until the very end for questions on on REAP also. Is that correct, Mark? Yes, let's wait till the till the okay. end here and we'll right. answer those questions. Excellent. And our guest speaker, Ryan McCarthy, has actually had um, the REAP program as well as the value added producer grant. So he's also a great resource for questions. All right, so what is the value added producer grant? This is a grant that will help ag producers for processing, marketing, and selling, which includes distributing your value-added products. Um, it's for the sole purpose of, ex of helping you to expand your market and increase your revenues and customer base. Um, I wanna mention right off the bat that uh, we get this a lot in initial questions is can it pay for equipment? or help to construct a building or those sorts of um, things. It is not used for that at all. It can, it will, if you think of it as post-harvest um, expenses, um, it, it kind of covers that. So we'll go into that a little bit. So there's two parts to the value added. It can be a planning grant up to 75,000. Um, and it, the planning can be to cover if you wanted to do a complete feasibility study or business and marketing plans can be used for that. Um, and if an uh, um, applicant does use it for planning, they can come back later and use it for the second purpose, which is the working capital, 250,000 maximum, um, which is for operational expenses and um, everything that has to do with the value added product. Uh, and again, it doesn't cover um, 
uh, production or growing expenses and no equipment or construction. Okay, so our typical program forever that I know of for the last uh, 15 years is it's a 50-50 match. So if you had a $500,000 project that was going to, to uh, go through three years, our grant could cover 250,000 of that. Um, something new that is uh, this year because of the COVID relief funds, we actually is going to be added um, an additional 36 million to the already $40 million pot um, for a total of 76 million. That's a, that's a lot of funds. So um, there's going to be amendment to the uh, federal register that's already been published that gives a March uh, 22nd deadline. So once the new publication is issued, it's going to give an additional 60 days. So anybody who's heard about the grant and knows about that March 22nd deadline, that is going to be extended. Unfortunately, it's not, you know, it's not been uh, published yet. So I kind of have to just give you that information off the top of my head. So if you were at all close to or interested in applying, you're going to have additional time to uh, work on that. Um, that's a lot of funds. And I guess I'm gonna to switch to a, just a little bit of statistics. I don't have a slide for that, but I just wanted to let you know that out of the whole nation as a five-year average, um, Washington State's actually spent the most in value-added um, producer grant funds as well as had the most projects. And I think that's pretty amazing when you look at some of the high um, ag states like California, which is, yeah, they're, we're kind of neck and neck, but uh, we still have more. And I think one of our, uh, I'll say specialties for our state, especially the west side of our state, is we have a lot of small, small farmers, um, small farms, I mean. And um, so that, but even with that, again, we have used more funds. So I guess I'm saying that to say that, you know, through our business programs, we really do support the value added producer grant and we do have people in addition to me that um, can help you get through that process so um, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to state that and you know we can all be proud of our, our state for sure okay we can um, move on okay so for applicant eligibility uh, you can apply as an egg producer um, and that would mean that you are fully and directly engaged in the production of your ag commodity and that you have the uh, legal right to that ag commodity um, that you are going to be using for the value added project. Um, and directly engaged, that second paragraph goes on to say that you, per, you substantially participate in the labor management field operations and maintaining the ownership so that it, uh, a non uh, an absent um, farm owner would not be eligible under this program. Okay. Uh, there are four uh, applicant types, independent producers, which make up the greater part of the applications that we received. And the previous slide kind of uh, indicated what independent producers would be. And then there's ag producer groups, which still have to be um, uh, you know, legal groups that are formed with all of the members being independent producers. And then farm and rancher cooperatives, which we have done um, recently, last year did uh, a couple of cooperative um, grants into the value added. And then the less used uh, is the majority controlled producer based businesses, but we can move forward. Next slide. Um, so the independent uh, producers, Go on to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm not that experienced at Zoom, so maybe go back to the previous slide. <laughs> so you must be able to produce and provide more than 50% of your raw commodity to be used in your value added product. Um, and you must own the product from its raw commodity state uh, through the value added um, project. Um, for value added products with uh, multiple ingredients, a producer, you don't have to uh, produce all of the ingredients. You just have to have one of those ingredients and that one ingredient um, you have to grow 
or produce on your farm or ranch over 50%. So um, with the value added uh, project, you would qualify the product in five different methods. And I think the next slide talks about that. You must show in your uh, application and in your plan that you will increase your current customer base and increase um, revenues uh, due to that value added um, product that um, will be done. So even if you're increasing, you know, five customers or two customers, um, you know, some of the smaller grants that is allowable. Okay, go ahead. So the five methods of adding value, you have to qualify for um, at least one. Sometimes there's more, but you would select one and it's um, just easier to go ahead and describe that one method rather than have to spend all your time describing all methods in your application. And it's perfectly acceptable. You do not get extra uh, points and it is a competitive grant. So you would not score more for listing, you know, one to one, two, three, or four, or whatever. So um, the, the main one that's usually used is changing the physical state of your product. So an easy example would be apples to applesauce or um, greens to bagged greens, um, that kind of thing. Um, actually, and then the second would be locally produced marketed and distributed. So let's just say you're, you're, you're not changing the physical state, but you're marketing it as, I don't know, I'll just say Squim Valley um, grown, you know, that would be, um, you're producing it there and you're marketing it and distributed it under that um, name. So that would be your method of adding value. Um, and then just, or just locally and locally for us is anywhere within the state or, um, no more than 400 miles away, even if it's in another state. So that's a, a pretty big area for locally. And then the um, number three would be an enhanced uh, production methods. And that would be uh, something like you are um, marketing it as uh, you know, organic certified or maybe grass fed. Um, so that would be an enhanced production method that you're using to, to you know, garner a higher price for your prod for your products. Uh, product segregation is a little more complicated. That is when you're, and I, uh, that is when you're segregating either what you're growing, or if it's an animal, you're segregating how they are. Um, let's say it's chickens. So <laughs> maybe you have your caged ones, and then you also in a completely different separate area would be having, you know, maybe pasture raised. And um, so we don't see as many of, of that uh, methodology, but that's um, possible. And then there is a renewable energy component, although we really rarely ever use that because we have the REAP program that I talked about earlier, which does really um, qualify for projects uh, of up to $500,000 grants. So Rarely would we ever use this renewable energy um, piece of it. And again, you would just meet one of those methodologies, even if you really do meet more than one, um, it would be how you're proceeding with filling out the application. And um, if you keep it simpler, you will, it, it will be easier for you. Okay, so product requirements. Um, we talked about all of these things, the five, methodologies, at least one you would be using, increasing your customer base and increasing revenues uh, to your farm uh, for your value added product. Um, I think uh, we covered this. Um, typically at the, we have the matching requirement where it's basically a one-to-one -one match or 50-50 match and then I, I mentioned that the new funding uh, maybe I did slip up not mention that the new 36 million that's being added in which we'll have the amended federal register coming out will allow for you to apply for the grant with only 10 percent of your matching uh, funding and we're going to talk about the matching funding here in a second and, and that's really a big thing. <laughs> so we'll see how that notice looks when it comes out. It might be a little bit confusing, but um, we're gonna get through it and still try to get as many uh, value added 
uh, projects funded in our state. Um, so eligible expenses under working capital. If you're not doing planning and you're going right to working capital, you can use um, expenses such as uh, processing, you know, post-harvest for labor. You can cover um, overhead utilities, other ingredients that you have to purchase. Again, remembering that you need to supply at least 50% of your ingredient that you're using for your value added. Packaging, labeling, um, and advertising, promoting, uh, any a kind of accounting cost, web development, distribution, shipping, delivery. Uh, we've had questions where if you're going to, let's say you're leasing, you want to lease a delivery truck or something like that, it would just have to be the type of lease situation that it wasn't leased to own. So um, otherwise, you can do what you want as long as you're not counting those expenses. It would have to be a, a not leased to own type of a lease that would be allowable. And then there are some um, minor equipment type costs that would be allowed, like let's say a label maker, um, maybe a laptop or some kind of software, those kind of things can be included. And they just have to be under, I think it's a $5,000 limit. Um, but again, none of the um, type of equipment that has to do with uh, the growing and harvesting. I know there's going to be lots of questions, but we'll get to them. And then again, for ineligible expenses, uh, kind of uh, bringing that home again, no construction, no equipment, no vehicles, um, no production and harvest costs and, and or engineering or any architectural for, uh, for construction or any of that. Uh, so back to the um, matching funds, which typically would you would be matching 50% total, but you may be applying for the 10% match. So that's going to kind of, and it is the first time I've ever seen it. So it's going to be a little confusing. But what I understand is that you can apply for the 10% um, uh 10% matching fund in the grant, and then you still would qualify, let's say you're not selected because of the scoring, you can still qualify for the 50% match as long as you're able to you know, present your budgets and all that, that is required to show that. Again, it's, it's a little awkward talking about it because we've never um, done it and the federal notice is not even out yet, but we'll get through it. Um, so uh, matching funds, there's different um, ways to look at this also. Um, applicant cash, which can include loans, um, you know, does score a bit higher than if you're using some of these other methods. So another um, uh, good one that's very popular is that uh, applicants will use their own raw commodity, uh, the value of that as part of their matching. Um, so that, you know, you could probably easily use up 10% just in your raw commodity there. So it is possible to get this grant without coming up with actually any cash or loans. Um, then the third method would be um, applicant or applicant's family in-kind contributions. So this would be your contributions to the project, either whether it be processing or anything that you're doing as far as marketing or any of that kind of thing, but that can only make up 25% of the total project costs. So there's a, you know, just you can in your mind put a little asterisk next to the applicant in kind um, contributions. And then um, third party cash um, can be, is allowed and third party in kind contributions. So these are, um, the third party in kind could be maybe another organization is volunteering there in-kind time to help you do, I don't know, um, marketing or web web development or you know something of that sort. So matching is kind of a big deal, but um, um, obviously from my end, I just love to see you know cash only. It's the easiest to document, and it's the easiest to for you to document later when you're asking for reimbursements. Um, okay, we can move on. Okay, um, 
So under application types, under working capital, there's some different benchmarks. And that's where it gets a little more complicated. And, and you know, I would definitely want to spend more time speaking with you um, to see what kind of benchmarks you're, you know, you're at. So a simplified application. Let's see, uh, Mark, if the next slide shows the breakdown of these. Okay, it does. So let's go back to the one again, sorry. <laughs> um, so there's, so you would either be applying under simplified, which basically is under 50,000 or market expansion or emerging market. So the next slides will go into a tiny bit more detail. So the simplified application is less than 50,000. So it could be, you know, 49,900, get a lot of those. So that would include any kind of applicant type that are eligible. And this one would not require a third party feasibility study or a third party business plan. It would just be, you know, you would just have your business plan built into your application or have your business plan that you've prepared yourself off to the side. So this is a pretty uh, popular way to apply. Um, again, as in all of them, you have to show customer uh, base expansion and revenue increase to your farm. Okay, next one, the emerging market. This work is a little more confusing, but this is if you're asking for a grant of over 50,000 and you have been producing and marketing your value added product for less than two years, um, it does allow for all applicant um, types. Um, and you do have to have an independent feasibility study and a business plan is required with this type of application. So the benchmark here is over 50,000 grant and uh, less than two years that you have been producing and marketing the value added that you're gonna be working on. Next. So market expansion, again, it is grants over 50,000 or 50,000 or more. And then um, the applicant would be producing and marketing for at least two years, so two years and more. So that's where that benchmark is. And again, um, uh, independent producers are the only eligible applicant type for this. So that's kind of a key thing too. Um, I, and like I say, most of our applicants are independent producers. So this one requires does not require an independent feasibility study. Um, but the applicant must, uh, you know, submit a marketing plan um, with their application. So there's, you know, some particulars that we would want to drill down to uh, when you're when you're looking at really applying. So we can move on from there. Um, so uh, this is one of our most complicated grant applications. Um, but there is assistance, uh, you know, available to kind of get you through it. Um, we have a, um, a toolkit that's on our national website so that every application across the nation um, uses the same uh, template and it's a toolkit. And part of that is the work plan and the budget, which describes your narrative um, of the project, pretty detailed, it, it requests pretty detailed information. Um, your goals and all of the tasks, your budget has to be broken down, um, whether it's labor and other tasks or supplies, all that kind of thing. Um, identification of all of the key people that are involved in carrying out the tasks, the time frames for all the tasks and um, for the entire project. Um, and your sources and uses of funding. So your sources and uses would be the grant funding, the value added, and your matching funds um, of those categories that we talked about earlier. And of course, there are some federal uh, forms, excuse me, that um, would go with that along with the toolkit. And then, um, you know, at the bottom of this screen, it says DUNS and SAM registration. So if you are not already signed up with a DUNS number, and SAM registration. And some of you may already have this because if you've used uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, you probably already have that, but this is a, a step that you would have to go through. Um, 
you will be provided with a link directly to our website. So if you're doing your DUNS and SAM registration, you don't wanna just Google it because um, this is a free process. Um, but if you Google it, you may get one of the other uh, sites that might do the job for you, but they will tell you that they wanna charge you 500 or 700 or whatever. And you don't have to do that unless you want to. So stick with the link that we provide you um, for the value added program for getting through that process. and. Um, it's totally doable process. Um, it, it just can take a little bit for the SAM registration, but the getting the duns first is the easy part. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Um, I mentioned that this is a competitive program. So basically um, all the applications that are received, let's say here in Washington state, we go the, through them for eligibility, basic eligibility and all of that thing. And we also do score it within our state. And then we send every one of them back to the national office. So all applications uh, compete with each other nationally. Um, so that's an interesting process, takes some time, um, but uh, is fair. Uh, so some of the criteria would be that, you know, for scoring is how well you have described the nature of your project. Um, so, you know, you're writing it so somebody that's not doing what you're doing can understand each step of the project and everything that it takes to um, have technical feasibility, operational efficiency, uh, profitability and sustainability. And the template, um, when you go through an application template, it looks like a lot and it is, but it does actually describe what we are looking at, what level of detail we're looking for. So, um, qualifications of the personnel. So that would be, you know, basically kind of like a resume, except for uh, you will have it, you know, um, simplified in the application to show your experience as a farmer, maybe any other um, experience off farm, as well as maybe degrees, that kind of thing. Commitments and support. So this is where we're looking at um, not just matching funds, uh, whether you're providing cash or in kind, but other um, commitments from end users and suppliers. Um, so that would be uh, like, let's say you're, you're going to market your value added product to, I don't know, some new stores. So you would be showing interest showed by the other stores or the farmer's market or whatever those would be. And then also if your value added project includes other suppliers, say your other, um, you know, the other ingredients that go into your value added product, you would be showing who those suppliers would be and maybe have letters of their intent, that kind of thing. So that, um, and again, the, uh, the toolkit really does describe what it is we would be looking at you to describe and to provide for attachments. Um, and then the work plan and budget, um, it will, as I said before, it'll break down really all the tasks of the project and um, break down the budget as far as what costs are going to everything um, in that project. Um, priority points. Uh, and again, the toolkit is set up where, you know, there's check marks where you are going to say if you're applying as a beginning farmer, which is farming 10 years or less, um, or socially disadvantaged or a veteran, or qualify as a small or medium farm. And I think that's a financial uh, benchmark as far as that goes. Again, the toolkit, if you dive into it and kind of go through it, um, you won't have to remember everything I'm saying here, but it's going to be, be in that uh, template. Okay, let's move forward. Um, here is my contact information, my phone number, and I welcome anybody to contact me. If this slide is made available to you, um, I think you'll be able to click also on the application toolkit, which is underneath the contact table so that you can get to the toolkit and take a peek at it maybe before contacting me and also the Duns and Sam um, direct uh, information for that. Um, and how did I do on time, Mark? You, you did just fine. And um, any last uh, closing thought that you have um, before we move to the question answer? 
I just, again, I wanna encourage anybody who's interested in looking into it um, to go ahead and, and um, you know, look at it, see if you're ready for, I'm, I'm gonna estimate that we're gonna have a new deadline that's gonna give you a couple more months from now. But again, it's not published, so I can't say exactly. Um, so there would be time to look into applying for it. If not, you can always start looking at it and tossing it around in your head and on paper for, you know, if there's a notice next year. Um, this is this and the REAP program are funded under the Farm Bill. Um, and I don't see the, the Farm Bill type of legislation going away anytime soon. Um, so it's not, it wouldn't be your last chance if you're just not ready to go, but sure would be glad to talk it over with you anytime that you contact me. All right. Thank you, Carlotta. Um, mm -hmm. Stay on because I've got a question or two and I'll ask Brian McCarthy to turn on his mic and um, come live so we can see him also. Uh, we do have actually a question. I know there was a question posed earlier that, um, Ryan uh, started to answer and, and did. And there's another question though that came up. And so the, this question is, so the value added producer grant can be used for an organic certification to market your product as organic, as in being certified organic is considered value added. Producer, is that, um, is that acceptable under the value added producer grant? Yes, it is. So if I'm not sure if the question is, can the expenses for, you know, going through the organic process or permitting or whatever it's called, I do believe those can be part of the, um, the cost. Generally, that would be one part of, you know, the larger project, project, but I sure would be glad to talk to the person if they want to contact me. All right, there you go. And, um, Another question is a follow-up question. There was an earlier question that Ryan did answer. Um, a follow-up question to it was, uh, can you clarify what a value-added product is exactly? Does it have to be consumable food or are other value-added products applicable? Yes, so it does not have to be um, a food product. Um, so I'll just, I don't know, I guess I can give a couple examples like, um, um, Oh, I just went blank. You know what they grow and swim, the uh, lavender. lavender. So lavender oh. has been, um, yeah. lavender has been used. And I think it was one of the swim farms years ago. And then, yeah, they can turn it into soap, lotions, you know, those kind mm. of things. And then other examples might be. Um, uh, um, How about flower wood? and flowers and seed and. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it can be a wide variety um, and even harvesters that don't own their own farm, if they have a legal right, can, can collect. Um, we use that less, but that's an option too. So there's quite a few different options. So if anybody's mm -hmm. really wondering and they have an idea, shoot me an email or whatever and we can just um, you know address it. But yeah, it does not have to be a food item. Okay. Great, thank you. Stay on Colorado because we have, um, I'm gonna ask you some questions too. The, uh, we're going to move to the question and answer quick part here with Ryan McCarthy, but I did wanna say that Eric Jorgensen and Christy Kissler, uh, they're the co-owners of Thin River Farm and Ranch. They have successfully applied and received uh, the REAP grants, the Value Added Producer Grant and the RBDG Rural Business Development Grants uh, through USDA. They couldn't be here today, but they did write some very thorough answers to each of the grants. And also they answered the questions that are going to be posed here this morning. So and that's going to be uh, included with your follow up information. So you'll have that from them. Uh, so thank you, uh, Eric and Christy from Thin River uh, Cidery and Farm for um, following up and producing some really nice uh, thoughtful answers to the questions and, and the sort of the process that they went through through the application. So uh, with that, uh, Ryan McCarthy. Uh, Ryan, will you uh, give a plug just for a moment about uh, Dungeness Valley Creamery that you and Sarah own and, um, and then uh, just talk about the grant 
that you have received or grants that you have received through the USDA. So take a few moments and talk about Dungeness Valley Creamery and your operation and the grants. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, Dungeness Valley Creamery is a raw milk dairy and squim, and we've been in existence in this location since 1992. Sarah and I took over from her parents, Jeff and Debbie Brown, in 2012. So actually, at the end of this month, in a few more days, we'll be completing our ninth year of owning the business. Um, we, I first met Carlotta actually at the one of these workshops in person in 2014, I believe. And uh, that was when I was first looking at the value added producer grant. And um, I ended up applying first for the Rural Energy for America program, REAP grant for a 25% cost share on a uh, $80,000 project. So we received $20,000 in cost share for 72 panels, uh, solar panels to be put on our barn roof. In 2015, I applied for the our first value added producer grant doing a, I had to look at my notes, I think it's a locally produced option. Um, and, and so we were awarded a $250,000 cost share grant on a $500,000 project. And uh, that was to expand the presence of our products in the marketplace and just branding it mostly as like locally produced. And in 2020, we were awarded another grant project for a A2 um, milk product that we're about to be launching any day now. I've been waiting on labels that finally came through, but um, another grant project that'll run the next you know, three years or two and a half years to go. And that's for a product segregation option of segregating out the A2 beta casein uh, protein milk from cows that have that genetic trait and we'll be marketing and branding that under its own label. Um, so we're really excited to be working with now our second project. And uh, Carlotta has been great to work with and the USDA office in our area has been really um, a great asset to our farm and a lot of other farms in the area. All right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so I'm going to ask the first question here. Uh, so as you were starting through this, this process, what were, what actually, uh, what were the actual perceptions versus what you originally perceived uh, before beginning the grant process? What did you think it was like before versus what it actually turned out the process to be? Um, the first time I went, I thought that the application process was going to be way over my head. It looked um, kind of overwhelming to look at because that, um, application itself is somewhere in the 20 plus page range. But as Carlotta mentioned, it's a template. So I think after I got going through it, I realized it was really almost like a paint by numbers of how to apply for the grant. And as long as you stick with that format, I believe you're allowed to use any format. I, Carlotta might be able to speak to this better, but I don't think anybody does use their own <laughs> format uh, because you might miss something. And really it, it tells you exactly how they're gonna score it in detail. And on, after our first grant, I asked for a copy of my scorecard and they were able to provide me the notes and responses of where we, where we could make improvements so that on our second round, uh, we made sure to get a better understanding of how to, how to score better. So I don't know that we actually did uh, yeah. score better in the end, but um, we did a more thorough job in those areas that, that I have some points on. So you, you do feel that sticking to the application template is the way to go. Okay. Yes. Great. Yeah. Um, tell me in just large details, what type of information did you have to submit? What were the, the basic categories of, of information? I know Carla, Carlotta talked about it, but tell me a little bit more from your perspective. I think that uh, it, the template has you build out a lot of information about your farm. So there's a good chance most farms are already going to have some content related to this, even if it's just something on a brochure or a website. And you, you'll just elaborate on that and turn it into more thorough documents. So I think in part, it sort of creates or forces you into creating a three and five year plan. Um, you're gonna do projected analysis of, of cash flow or revenue through the project. And it's gonna really guide you through the process of making sure that your project is successful with the, the business plan portion and the market analysis research that you do, as well as uh, you're in part asking for some of those letters of support. Um, that was one of the areas that 
I made some mistakes on the first time. I got letters of recommendation, but not letters of commitment and letters of, of support. So letters of commitment are more specifically um, a grocery buyer or an end use consumer that's pledging that they're going to purchase a set amount of product. And uh, there's a lot of great resources in our area, including like WSU Extension, in our case, the North Olympic Land Trust, both um, North Olympic Development Council and the Clallam EDC uh, wrote letters for me last time. I think I had about eight or nine letters of support, um, including I think I had one done by a graphics designer. Um, and then I pulled that at the end because I thought it wasn't as applicable since I'm more of a customer. Than is. But I was kind of asking everybody and it's amazing the amount of support and people that are willing to um, provide detail for you for in support. Actually, I think you made a real nice clarification there, the difference between a letter of support and a letter of commitment. And I think that that is really um, important uh, distinction for so people understand. And uh, Carlotta, do you have anything uh, regarding letters of support and letter of commitments that you want to add to that? Um, I think uh, Ryan described it pretty well. And, um, you know, um, in the template, it does talk about what type of letter of commitment it is, whether it's an end user like a buyer, or again, whether it's um, uh, some other, you know, supplier that is integral to your, to getting the, the value added product out. Those are like, let's say, um, oh, in the, not in Ryan's case, but where somebody needs a cold storage place, or they need a processing kitchen or something like that they've got a letter of commitment from an owner of a of a commercial kitchen or an owner of a cold facility you know that kind of thing because that if you can, don't have those pieces to your plan in place it's not it's not valid hopefully right. that helps <laughs> yes uh, so I'm going to throw a, another curveball question in here just before we move on, because Ryan, you touched on this, and I think Carlotta can add to it too. Um, is it fair to say that before applying for some of either of these grant projects that it really is probably a good idea for businesses to have a, a, a basic business plan in place first? Most definitely. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and there are resources, if you have not done that, there are a number of resources out there through WSU, through a Small Business Development Council, and we can provide some contact information for some of the classes and some of the programs that, and services that are available for that. Um, but I think um, as, as a person, as, as a, a also in my case, a lender, I always like to see business plans and, and have people have gone through those process. So I, um, if I do wanna support um, that, uh, process ahead of time of preparing yourself for, for these and other issues by preparing a business plan. So just wanted to add that plug in there. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Ryan, next question. The biggest surprise of the process, the application process for you? Um, the biggest surprise was what Carlotta already touched on today. And that was that you can't use the funds for equipment. So I think when I went in, uh, was it 2014 around there? Um, the people next to me left at the first break. They were um, they were kind of talking. They were even talking with me, and they said, "Oh, we we thought we'd be able to buy some equipment. We just need equipment." Um, and there's probably a lot of people attending today. That was my plan as well. I was gonna somehow I went in with this idea that I was going to um, purchase ice cream equipment at a facility, and I was gonna go into ice cream because when I thought value added, I thought yogurt, cheese, and ice cream were value added dairy products. Um, it didn't really occur to me at the time that locally produced dairy products are also a value added product or our existing product that we were already marketing was a value added mm -hmm. dairy product. And after, after going through the process of the uh, REAP grant, so I didn't apply for the VAPG my first year. I went through the REAP uh, grant and that was, I guess, a little bit of a confidence booster that I could tackle one of these grants, even though that was a different, an entirely different application. I went back with the, the intent of finding, you know, how can I make my business fit this program rather than how can I make my vision for a value added product fit this program. And so that was a big eye opener. Also in how we tackled our second project, we had um, Sarah and I mapped out, we, we've actually started with those kind of business plan resources from the first round. We've started doing annual meetings and even quarterly meetings and we more or less talk about them all the time, but more formal meetings where we document 
ideas and plans for our future vision and future growth. And that kind of led us into three different projects that we were considering writing. And I, I just kind of went with the one that I feel like inspired me the most of what I, where I wanted to see us go as a company. Uh, but there were there were two other viable projects that I could have easily written that that particular grant for, and I think after we got Carlotta's call that we were awarded this one in 2020, um, the wheels already started turning for the you know the the next where can we go after this, um, and that's more in that you know end of the year. Sarah and I had our our five to ten year plan review, and we talked about just all kinds of different ideas. But that was my my biggest surprise. Um, the other more positive surprise that I would add is how much support there is in our area for um, for businesses. I my first time I didn't know much about any local resources available, and uh, since then I've just made a lot more connections and built out a network of knowing who to call for what type of resource. And I'd be happy to share in more detail if anyone's looking for those resources. But we have a lot of people willing to help with these projects or at least bounce ideas off of. Um, and, and there's just a lot more out there than I was aware of five years ago. Good. Well, I think you've partially answered uh, number four. So I'm gonna move on to number five. So what was the biggest gap or hurdle that you had to overcome to get the application submitted? Um, you know, one of the hardest challenges for me was saying that the project or the application was finished. Um, the first time I actually hired a review, and I think this will actually come up again in one of the other questions, but I did pay a professional grant writing firm um, for uh, 20 hours of their time reviewing my application. And the next time I, I just decided it was, um, it was a, about $3,000 for that review. I decided I was going to tackle it on our own. Uh, but our last day before it had to be mailed, it had to be postmarked the next day. Sarah and I spent uh, 13 hours reading page by page and setting them in order. And I reprinted everything. So it was on this nicer quality paper and um, just kind of letting go of it and sending it in the mail was honestly one of the biggest challenges I had. Um, it was hard to, it was hard to say it's done because there's always something you can add or change. Right. Uh, is there, and uh, along that, is there a time period, this is for Carlotta and Ryan, is there a time period when it's submitted that, um, that you, that Carlotta, you may have questions when you first read through it, is there time for say, hey, Ryan, what do you mean by this? Or uh, can you clarify something for me? Is, is that opportunity available once uh, it's, it's done, the application is turned in? So yes, it is. If um, you know, once the new federal uh, publication is, has got a deadline in place, if I have it enough time, enough time to review it before the deadline, I can give feedback. If it comes in on the deadline, um, I'm not really going to be able to do that. So okay. I think it actually says it in the federal register in the publication that if you give us 30 days, we'll look at it. But uh, you know. Uh, you, it doesn't have to be 30 days. I'll still take a look at it, but mm -hmm. I can't guarantee, yeah, <laughs> you know, that right. I can everything. But definitely, I, oh, look, last year, I caught um, a pretty big mistake on one where they just didn't address the customer base at all. Uh, you know, you have to increase your customer base and somehow they just, they, it, boom, it wasn't there. And so we're able, they were able to save that um, because they, they, their plan was to do that and they had the info just somehow wasn't in there. So it was, they had applied like a week prior. So I was able to help them okay. to fix that, you know, kind of a major thing that would have put them completely out of the running. But sometimes mm -hmm. we're able to help on things that would help, you know, the score quite a lot and, mm -hmm. you know, 10 points. Yeah. Um, means a lot so yep. definitely to the best of my ability um, I'll look at them beforehand. And Carlotta uh, saved me on my application as well with uh, pointing out the need for, for a feasibility study. Um, I sort of probably selectively misunderstood the application and convinced myself that I didn't need a, a feasibility study but I, I did in fact need one. Um, so that's where having a good jump on it early on and being able to have someone like Carlotta who sees 
I have some hundreds of these over the years. Um, it's nice to have somebody that really knows these things look at it. Uh, because I believe, is it still true, Carlotta, that if you have 10% ineligible expenses in your budget, you'll be disqualified? Yeah, let's say it came in on the deadline. I couldn't look at it. And um, I'm like, oh, they included, obviously, a bunch of things that weren't eligible. Let's say if that exceeded 10% of the total project costs, we wouldn't even be able to ask you to change that and fix it. But let's say there was just a few things thrown in. We're like, yeah, that's not going to cut it. Uh, but we can determine you eligible. And then later, if we are able to fund you and award it, we would you would chop that out of your budget and your planning. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip number six and tell me about uh, Ryan number seven between you play for the REAP and got the REAP grant and the um, um, rural business, or excuse me, the value add producer grant. Uh, waiting periods uh, until notification for you. Um, that's from the application being submitted until. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Until you were notified of being awarded the, the grant. I'm guessing Carlotta and I have opposite answers because it probably seems really fast to her when she gets reviewing them <laughs> and then the scores come back and then she has to do all the paperwork on the processing end. Um, for me, the first time was, it felt like an eternity in part because I was checking online every day. I would just do a little quick search online for, um, for the information. And it actually doesn't come out on the internet before Carlotta gets it and you get the phone call and I believe is that the um, local governments get an opportunity to announce funding. Um, so, uh, but I would say it was, it's a couple month window. Does that sound right, Carlotta? Maybe a two to three month window or maybe a little longer than that. I think I applied. Well, like for, for the, it's different for both programs. So REAP, it depends on um, what cycle you've applied for. So we have just received our um, funding allocation for our state for REAP for the energy program. And we've had people that applied, you know, back in October. That's the win of our new fiscal year, but we just received our allocation of funds. So there's a whole period of time that we couldn't even uh, really, we could score them, but we couldn't tell anybody, you know, how they ranked until we actually had the funding. So the REAP program is a little, di is a little different there than the value added in that we have Oh, whenever the deadline is, we will have a couple of months here in our state, our employees in our state to go through the eligibility and the scoring and get it up to the national level. And then they have a couple of months because they've got to send it out to independent um, reviewers and those that score it that are independent of government, you know. Um, and so that that process uh, does seem like it takes forever. So, um, you know, I would say you're at least going to wait four or five months on the value added okay. to find out, I think. <laughs> okay. So Ryan, I have two more questions for you, number eight and nine. Um, and real quickly, you have the REAP and then you have the value added producer grant. Once you received notification, what was the grant implementation process like for you? You feel it was it was for, it went smoothly and it was very, you know, strong communication back and forth. Or was there a lot of um, aha moments in the implementation? I would say for us, because it was just one project for the REAP grant, it was just solar. It was one contractor. We used Power Trip Ener Energy in Port Townsend, and because it was kind of one invoice, it was a fairly simple process. We ran into a couple hiccups where I believe this has been change going forward, but there was a unity of ownership required between the owners of the physical structure of the solar panels, the PUD account holder and the underlying landowner, which we leased the property that we're on. And so we were able to get that cleared up with, um, with the state to just, um, gosh, I wanna say through like purchasing, the corporation purchased the barn for a dollar because it's my in-laws. And uh, it was pretty easy to work through, but it was just a small snag. Um, the first project for us, because it was, uh, uh, I just blanked on the type of project. Uh, locally expansion. produced. Locally produced. Yeah. So be, being a locally produced project, it was, in a lot of ways, it was a continue, continuation of business as usual with the addition of extra marketing efforts and extra outreach. 
Um, but it was a lot easier to get started. And then this more recent project has just had um, a lot more to get the product launched in terms of graphic design. And with COVID, there's been some delays. But at the same time, it's been it's been a good experience to like work through. And but it was a, a learning curve between you know you make phone calls and something's going to take two weeks, but then all of a sudden it takes six or eight weeks. So I feel like there've just been more delays. So, but in terms of getting, once you get the template of how you're going to do the reimbursements, and so Carlotta sends a more or less a, a spreadsheet where you enter in all of your product expense categories. And once you get that started with your first uh, reimbursement draw, it becomes a pretty simple template to just plug in the next, the next round of it. So it was pretty easy to work through that process. So Ryan, um, I'm gonna ask you one more question, but before I do, I'm gonna have Kelly uh, come back on uh, so she can give some closing remarks regarding um, follow-up information and things like that. So, uh, so she can be prepared, uh, but the uh, question, last question for you, Ryan, uh, and thank you so much for participating today. This is very helpful, very informative, um, and I hope everybody here uh, gained a lot uh, by hearing uh, from Carlotta and Ryan and hopefully the information from uh, Finn River uh, Cider and Creamery when they, um, uh, Cidery and Farm, when they uh, post their stuff for you afterwards. So Ryan, the last question is, and I, I know this must get easier over time as you do more of them, but, but would you do these, go through these grant processes again and now that you've uh, been through it? I would. Um, my role on the farms changed a lot since the first application and in some ways it's been more stressful. Like I, I actually was naive enough to think after we were awarded the first grant that I was somehow going to have an easier job in general because we were gonna have this uh, funds coming in to offset some of these expenses. And um, I, it's just shifted a lot where I deal with more marketing. You know, you, you have to put in, for example, the, the money that you commit to spend on marketing. And then you have to guide that process. And in our case, a lot of that's just fallen on me to do, and it's not something that came real naturally for me. So I, there have been new challenges and new learning curves, but I would do it again uh, and, and hope to do it again if the funding's still there in another three or four years for these programs, uh, because it's changed it so much for the better. Uh, I feel like it's made our farm more economically resilient. We being able to grow. Uh, we, we've called it commonly referred to it as like pouring gas on a fire. Like things were going well for us, but all of a sudden it went faster. So everything just happened a lot on a lot quicker timeline and really pushed the tempo of growth for our farm. But it's benefited in terms of job growth and expansion of our of our business, our customer reach, our jobs that we offer, and the amount of money we're able to pay. Um, it's also made us more resilient to things. We just had a a big expense on a manure system upgrade. And while grant funds weren't related to that, it's nice knowing that we have these projects helping grow our business so that we'll be more economically resilient and able to afford these things when they come up. So the, the growth in your business, uh, going through this process has helped the growth in your business to help your farm become more resilient to um, the things that can happen to your operation. Yeah, yes. That's, that's a great, closing point, uh, talking about uh, growth and building farm and family, farm and family resiliency. So great. Um, I want to thank you, Ryan, for participating and uh, answering these questions. You did a great job. Uh, Carlotta, as usual, you always do a fantastic job putting together the programs and, and working with the clients. And we, uh, we all really appreciate the effort that you put out uh, for us um, as farmers, as producers, as um, as a food community here on the Olympic Peninsula. It's very supportive and we all owe you a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And if anyone wants to get my contact information, if it's all right, I could give it to you, Mark, or put it in the comments if anyone wants to ask any follow-up yep. questions. We'll have Kelly add that to the follow-up. So Kelly, I'm gonna turn it over to you to close uh, with uh, what's, what people will find next uh, coming to them. Sounds good. Thanks, Mark and Thank Carla you, Mark. and Ryan. And everyone who registered for this webinar will receive a follow-up email from me with this slide deck from Carlotta, contact information, 
follow-up information and answers from Finn River Cidery, as well as a link to the evaluation of this webinar. As soon as we end the webinar, you'll automatically uh, be sent to the evaluation. So you can fill it out right now, give us uh, some feedback. It's only four questions and you'll also be emailed um, the evaluation. So with that, I will close and thank you so much for everyone's time. So um, thank you everyone. As, as we close, maybe Kelly, you would answer uh, the second to the last question question there, um, or maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll type an answer in uh, for Meryl Six here, who has a, a question, and I'm just going to, I'll just type an answer before we close it out so it gets captured. Sounds good. Thank you. Right. Um, I will um, leave it open then so you can answer sure. questions.